Hello, AP Statistics students. This is Ms. Skoken, and we are in Chapter 5, which is all about probability. The title or subtext is What are the Chances? And this is actually one of my favorite chapters because we do the fun part of probability, looking at different circumstances and situations, and framing them in a probability format. Also, we use probability notation, we use set notation, and it this chapter five is the first of three chapters that are basically about probability, randomness, and then something that we're going to call sampling distributions in chapter seven. Those three chapters are our transition from descriptive statistics and data generation into inferential statistics. So this is where it starts to get interesting. Let's go ahead and take a look at our objectives. And we have few in section one, but of course we have three sections in chapter five, so we'll be back again. First of all, interpret probability as a long run relative frequency. F relative frequency, remember, is when we use percentages, we can also think of them as proportions, and now we're also gonna think of them as probabilities. And we're going to get some practice using simulation to model chance behavior. We'll do some simulations in class together. The idea behind probability is that although we see a lot of variation in behavior in the short run, when we think about the long run, the very long term, many, many, many trials, we start to see particular outcomes emerge with specific frequencies. So for example, if I flip a coin once, I know I have a 50% chance of getting a heads and a 50% chance of getting a tails because if I'm using a fair coin, they are equally weighted, the two sides, the two faces. But on the second trial, if I get a second heads in a row, if I get a heads the first time and a heads the second time, I'm not suspicious. I think that that's fine. I know over the very, very, very long run, I should end up with about 50% heads and about 50% tails. But for the first two or five or 10 or maybe even 100 or possibly even 1,000, I don't have the expectation necessarily of getting exactly 50% or even super close to 50%. So in the short run, anything can happen. Chance behavior is unpredictable. In the long run, we start to see that there is predict predictable behavior. And that means we have an expectation or a specific relative frequency for a particular outcome. We know that probability has a value, we, we treat it as a percent, that means it's out of one, and it has a particular value between zero and one. A probability of zero means it has no chance of ever happening. A probability of one means that it is a sure chance of happening, absolutely is going to happen. But everything else in between can take place. We can never have negative probability, remember that, and we can never have probability above one. Eventually that is going to be the way that we judge different probability distributions to make sure that they are valid. We often as humans think that we can come up with random lists, random selection, but this is really a myth. Even though we understand probability, we're not really good at being random. So we're gonna take a look at some of the myths. One of the myths is the idea of short run predictability or regularity. We do understand long run. We can all agree that in the long run, if I were to flip a coin 10,000 times, we would be able to see approximately very close to 50% heads and 50% tails. We think for some reason, humans are misunderstanding that and extrapolating it to the short run. We think that we should be able to predict in the short term what the outcome will be of a chance process, such as if I flip a coin 10 times and I get 10 heads in a row, I feel uncomfortable because I feel like that should not happen. But what we need to remember is that if every trial has an equal probability of taking place, then we might get 10 heads in a row and we shouldn't be suspicious that there's something wrong with our coin because that's a very short run. The idea of the law of averages is basically when we think that an outcome has happened 
frequently enough so that we expect the next time a different outcome so that things will eventually right themselves or even themselves out. This is not something that we should ever use for anything. The law of averages does not exist. This is not a thing and we cannot assume that we can predict specific individual outcomes based on previous behavior, either because we think it's going to continue, which we'll see in the next example, or because we think it's going to be different. Now, the idea behind simulation is when we're trying to to imitate, what we want to do is we basically want to gather data. And what we're going to do is we're going to imitate the behavior using some other method. It can be technological, such as the random integer feature of our graphing calculators, or it can be something low tech, like using a die or the random digits table. When we perform a simulation, we basically want to know the, the assumptions. What is the information that we're trying to learn about? Ask a question of interest about the chance process. Then we need to figure out what it is we're going to do to imitate or simulate that chance process and what we're going to measure or record with the process. Then we're going to perform many repetitions of the simulation. Now, many is up for debate. It could be as few as 20. It could be as many if we're using technology and it's very easy for us to do. We could run a thousand simulations, such as when we're flipping a coin with the applet, the statistical applet, and we can literally flip 200 coins at once with the click of one button. Eventually, of course, we're going to be comparing the results of the simulation to what our expectations were and what we claimed or assumed was the true situation, reflecting back on our question of interest. And remember, we always do this in context. So we have a lot of different choices for simulation. Again, flipping a coin, rolling a die. It could be the calculator. It could be our random digit table. We have an example in our textbook that talks about a promotion that a breakfast cereal company runs where they have collectible cards for five different NASCAR drivers that they're putting in their boxes of cereal. So the, the company says that each of the cards is equally likely, meaning if we have 100% split by five, each of the cards has a 20% chance of being in any of the cereal boxes, or they are producing and distributing 20% of the boxes with each of the five different drivers. A NASCAR fan decides to buy the boxes of cereal until she has all five drivers cards. This is her goal to collect all five. And it takes her 23 boxes of cereal to get one of each of the five cards, a full set of cards. Should she be surprised? So the problem that we're trying to to face or we're trying to use a simulation in order to answer is what is the probability that it will take 23 or more boxes to get a full set of the five NASCAR collectible cards. We need to represent the five cards so we could do this in a number of different ways but we need to represent basically 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20% and 20% for a total of course of 100%. Again, we have a lot of different options about how we're going to do this, but imagine that we're going to use the rand int, random integer feature of our calculators, and we're going to select a random integer between 1 and 5 inclusive. That's going to represent buying one box of cereal and then figuring out which card is inside. We've assigned 1 to Jeff Gordon, 2 to Dale Earnhardt Jr., 3 to Tony Stewart, 4 to Danica Patrick, and five to Jimmy Johnson. So depending on what random integer we get, that represents which card for, of the NASCAR driver we got. We want a full set of cards. So we're gonna keep on using our random integer generator until we get one of each. And then we're going to record how many boxes we actually had to buy or how many times we had to use our rand int to get at least one of each of the five unique values representing the five possible driver cards. So it took, in our first trial, nine boxes or nine random integers for us to get five unique, one, two, three, four, and five boxes. In our second trial, it took us 16 boxes 
In our third trial, it took, took 10 boxes. Now this is something that you can try out and you can see at home. So just get your calculator out. Remember you go to math, the math button, then prob for probability features, and then rand in is one of your options. You want between one and five. On our fourth trial, 15 boxes. On our fifth trial, 22 boxes before we were able to get the five cards. And after we run 50 different simulations, we're able to graph all of the outcomes on this dot plot. What we see is we never, out of our 50 trials, we never got one where we had to buy 23 boxes in order to get all five. So what this means is we are very unhappy with the cereal company because in our simulation where we assumed that their claim was true, it never happened in 50 trials. That means the probability from our simulation resulted in a probability of zero of having to buy 23 boxes to get the five cards. Okay. We have looked at probability as a long run relative frequency. Remember, 10 coin flips is not enough. And we did practice using simulation to model chance behavior. Pay close attention to this only because you are definitely going to have to design different simulations on your AP exam at the end of the year. So you always kind of want to be thinking, how would I represent this? using the random digit table, using randint, using a coin flip, etc. All right, I'll see you back for section two.